Good morning. Welcome to the West Plains Christian Church. Today is Sunday, uh, December the 3rd, in the year 2023. And if you look around the sanctuary, this is the start of our Christmas season. And so, uh, for our reading this morning, we're going to be in the Gospel of John. We're going to start in the first chapter, and this is what John tells us about the Advent. He says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. In the 14th verse, he says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And so as we look at the uh, four Gospels, the book of Mark jumps right into Jesus' ministry. Matthew and Luke talk about the how of the advent, how it happened. John tells us why it happened. And as we look at the Bible, we see a very sharp contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament. As you look at the Old Testament, it is so radically different. Every page is full of lust, murder, greed. It's, it's a very blood-soaked uh, revelation of God. It's been said that uh, God in Genesis said, let us create man in our own image. And somebody who was much smarter than I was said that, and then man has said, let us create God in our own image. As we look at what we see in the Old Testament, it's filtered through people who Jesus said our heart is full of murder, lust, greed, all these things. That's the God we see filtered, and that's the God we see presented. In the New Testament, we see God among us, and we are beholding him for ourselves, and we can actually see what God looks like without being filtered through a uh, very corrupt lens. Uh, as we read in the Old Testament, the story of Samson, the glory and the fact that he killed more people in his death than he did in his life. And so if Jesus would have been in the Old Testament, the story of him before Pilate would have been much different. When Jesus was before Pilate, Peter would have drawn him the sword, Jesus would have took the sword, and he would have killed Pilate, and he would have led uh, a revolution. That didn't happen. When Jesus was on the cross, if this would have been in the Old Testament, Jesus would have looked down and said, I know where you live, and I'm keeping receipts. That didn't happen. And so we saw Jesus, and we saw him, we saw the revelation of God for who he truly was. And as you look at the start of his ministry, we look at Matthew, he starts out in the, the Sermon of the Mount. And what's the very first thing he says? The meek shall inherit the earth. And then he goes on to say, love your enemies and forgive people. And I'm certain there were people who heard that who walked off and they said, what do you think? And they looked at each other and they said, he seems like a very nice young man, but he's certainly naive. When he gets out of Galilee, he'll discover what the world's really like. His ministry went on. And we see him on the cross, being crucified. And what's he say? Father, forgive them. And this is so radically different that there were people who held that the God who was revealed in the New Testament was much different than the God that was in the Old Testament. It couldn't be the same God. Well, it's the same God. The only difference is we saw him for who he truly was, and we beheld his glory. And that, to me, is the message of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that we have beheld your glory. We thank you that we have seen you living in the flesh, and we now understand God for who you truly are. And we thank you for your great love. We thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take your hymnals and turn with us to hymn 122 of Como Come Emmanuel 123, pardon me, 123. Let's stand together and sing. <coughs>
Turnover 124. How long expected use? 124. today. Those that are joining us by way of the internet, we welcome you. We're glad that you're with us today. I want to uh, go ahead and get something out of the way uh, so that you don't spend the entire service curious uh, about the bandage on my head. Uh, I really don't know what happened. Uh, I woke up I woke up the other night and uh, my forehead and nose was all bloody and uh, I asked Becky what happened and she's pleading the fifth. So, so I really don't know. Uh, that, that's a better story than what really happened. But if you've heard of things that go bump in the night, well, sometimes that's your head. And uh, that, that's what happened to me. Um, somehow, uh, I, I woke up about 5 o'clock in the morning with a cramp in my leg. I'm sure that's never happened to anybody else. Uh, and it was so bad, I felt like I had to get up and put some pressure on it to get it to go away. And the next thing I knew, uh, somehow, I guess, getting out caused the bed to come up. <coughs> And uh, we got a little four-poster bed, but 
not real high post, but anyway, one hit me right in the head and uh, created a little problem. And uh, so that, that's why the bandage is there. I, I actually wanted to wrap my entire head in gauze and tell you that I had brain surgery, but I thought that was a little over the top. But anyway, it's no big deal, uh, but I thought a Band-Aid probably looked better than the, uh, than, than the wounds, so uh, thus it's there this morning. Uh, but all is well, and uh, in a couple of weeks you'll never know what happened. I don't think. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, uh, it is so good to be in the house of the Lord today. And uh, what a transformation that took place from last Sunday to this Sunday. Uh, one of my favorite time of the church year uh, when we come together and we decorate for the Advent and Christmas season. And I want to thank everyone that came and was a part of that. Uh, it, it was uh, a fun time. Uh, it was a frustrating time for some because they got some of this stuff hung and then was told that they had hung it wrong. And so it had to be flipped. And, uh, but they did it all without too much complaint. And uh, we got it all done. And uh, doesn't it look beautiful today? And uh, today is the debut of our brand new Christmas tree. Uh, I'm not sure. If, yeah, it looks beautiful. The ladies did a good job and the children did a, a good job in decorating it. I'm not sure how long we had had the other tree. I, I think maybe Noah had it on the ark. But uh, anyway, it finally got to the point that it needed to be replaced and and so we thank you for the support that you give to the church that allow us to do that. And uh, so it just looks so wonderful and uh, pretty, and we thank everyone for that. And then we had a great time of fellowship afterwards, and I want to thank everyone that brought food, and uh, we just had a good time together. Um, and so I uh, wanted to uh, give my appreciation for that today. Also... Uh, the youth are putting together a parade, uh, parade float for the Christmas parade, which will be uh, Saturday, the 9th. And uh, so they are needing some candy to share along the uh, parade route. If you can help them out with that uh, and maybe drop it by uh, the church, uh, we need you to have that done by noon on Thursday. So if you can help them out with that, it would be much appreciated. Uh, we are mindful today of those that are not with us. There are those that are dealing with whatever it is that is going around right now. Uh, Terry could not be here this morning. He's uh, dealing with that uh, head congestion and, and uh, others that uh, can't be with us today. Uh, also want to ask that you would pray for my mom. Uh, she is not feeling well this morning. And so uh, my sisters texted and asked that we could have prayer for her. And also a new name that has been added to our prayer list is Chris Reinholdt. And so we want to remember him in our prayer that the Lord would minister to his need. And uh, also all of those that remain on our list, we want to be uh, mindful of. There was a name that we took off that I will be placing back on. Uh, Chase Larson, uh, we shared with you a couple of uh, procedures that he had to go through to relieve uh, some blood clots that were in his arm. And, uh, and all of that went well. And so... Uh, we took his name off, but I saw his mother yesterday, and she told me that a blood clot has formed again. And uh, for a 17-year-old uh, young man that uh, loves to play sports, uh, it, uh, he had to give up this year's season, and uh, next year's season does, uh, may be in doubt. And so uh, you can imagine putting yourself in the shoes of a 17-year-old, watching all of his uh, 
contemporaries play the sport that he wishes he was able to play. And uh, even though they did everything they could and will continue to do everything they can to make him feel like he's a part of the team, uh, it's not like being out on the field. And so uh, we want to pray that God would uh, intervene and just take care of this situation so that Chase can enjoy his uh, young uh, adulthood, the rest of his school uh, time. He'll be a senior next year. And uh, he's just a great, uh, great young man. Uh, I wish that uh, you all could meet him. I call him Hollywood. And the reason I do is because I like to take pictures of, of Jack uh, when he's playing sports. And every time Chase comes by the camera, he'll stop and look at me and sort of give me a thumbs up. In other words, take my picture. And uh, so I, I started calling him Hollywood. And uh, he's just a great young man. And uh, we want to keep him in our prayers. If you have a need today, if you would acknowledge it by an uplifted hand, we'll take our cares to the Lord. Gracious Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for waking us up this morning and allowing us this opportunity to gather together as a family of faith. I thank you for all of your blessings, all of your goodness and kindness to us. I thank you for this wonderful congregation. And Father, today I thank you that you invite us to bring our needs to you. And Lord, you have heard each one that we have mentioned. You know every one that is acknowledged by that uplifted hand. And I pray that according to your will and according to your purpose, you would minister to each one today. I pray, Lord, that you would minister healing and comfort and strength and peace to all those in need of you this morning. Father, I ask that you would be with your people wherever they may gather today. I pray that your presence would be with them, that you would be with every minister that will share the gospel today. Father, that every uh, word would be received so that people would come to a better understanding of who you are and what you mean in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would be with us throughout the remainder of this service, that you would help me today to minister those things that you have placed in my heart to share. Be with our kids as they're in Sunshine Kids today. And Lord, help us to be a blessing to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. amen. We're going to dismiss our kids to Sunshine Kids today. While they're making their way out, I do want to reiterate to our guest how thankful and blessed we are that you are here with us today. And uh, as you have blessed us, we pray and trust that the Lord would be a blessing to you. If you have your Bibles today, we're turning to the book of Hosea. One of the minor prophets, Hosea chapter 13. And I'll read just one verse of scripture. Verse number 14. Hosea 13 and 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be your plague. O grave, I will be your destruction. Pity is hidden from my eyes. I want to minister to you for a few moments this morning on in anticipation of splendor. In anticipation of splendor. Today we begin our annual journey back to Bethlehem where the miraculous birth of Jesus changed the world forever. It is a journey that is worth repeating and celebrating. And for centuries, the church has done just that through what we call the season of Advent. Now, for those of you who, who may need a little refresher, 
the word advent comes from a Latin word, adventus, that simply means coming. Uh, in the ancient world, it referred to an official visit by someone of royalty. And so in the church, Advent is that period of expectant waiting and preparation for the celebration of the coming of Jesus, the Messiah. Now, this year, we're going to look uh, at Advent a little differently because what sometimes gets lost in the celebration is that Advent has a dual meaning for us as followers of Jesus. Advent should, and it does serve as a reminder uh, of God's divine plan of redemption that was made possible through the first coming of Christ as a baby in a manger. Uh, it's an old, old story, but it's a story that never gets old. And Advent reminds us of that. But it also should serve as a reminder that just as he promised, Christ will come again. And when he comes again, he is going to come in all of his glory as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is for once and for all going to destroy the works of the evil one and establish his throne with us, the church, by his side. And so the first coming of Christ put an end of the fear of spiritual death and separation uh, between us and God. And his second coming will put an eternal end to death itself. Now, we usually view Advent through the words of the gospel writers. Uh, matter of fact, last year, the four Sundays of Advent, I uh, took each week and looked at each of the gospel writers and how they framed and, and uh, discussed and gave to us the story of the first coming of Jesus. But this year, I'm, I'm going to try to frame it in the words of some Old Testament prophets. And we're beginning today with a prophet by the name of Hosea. Now from Israel's earliest bondage in Egypt. So this is going way, way, way back. From their earliest bondage in Egypt, God's people had long lamented for a deliverer. They sought for one that would liberate them from the tyranny of slavery. And their cries were met uh, by promise after promise from God that he would send a Messiah. Now, little did they know <clears throat> that the coming of Messiah would look nothing like what they were anticipating. And to the dismay of many, God's plan went far beyond their hope of just a physical deliverance of the body to the eternal deliverance of the soul. And in our text today, Hosea tells us of God's plan for redemption and for their deliverance. 
Through the prophet, God promised that he would ransom them from the power of the grave. Now, the word ransom just simply means to redeem or to rescue by paying a price. Which is exactly what happened when Jesus came the first time. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 tells us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now, the Old Testament patterns called for animal sacrifices to atone for sin. Every year, the children of Israel would have to bring sacrifice and the priest would offer that unto God and it would atone for them for a year. And then at the end of that year, the process would have to be repeated. But Hebrews chapter 9 tells us that Christ came. And it says that he came with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands. That is not of this creation. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more? Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. The work of Jesus Christ on the cross broke hell's stronghold on every sin-filled life that is willing to call upon the Lord for salvation. The Bible declares in Romans 6.14 that sin shall have no dominion over those who are blanketed by God's grace. And that promise is still valid today. Jesus offers freedom to the captive. Jesus offers deliverance to those that are bound. Jesus offers salvation to whosoever will. Whosoever is willing to come and to drink of the waters of salvation that opportunity is still open today because of what Jesus did so many, many years ago at Calvary. And this is something that is important to God. It was important to him that that gulf be bridged between himself and mankind. And the words of Hosea indicates an urgency and a determination in the plans of God. We can almost hear his resolve in his words. Death, I will be your plague. And grave, I will be your destruction. God hated death. And he hated separation with a vengeance. I, I want you to notice something that just sort of stuck out at me while I was preparing this message. I've never really thought about it before. But when God created Adam and Eve, he provided for them everything that they would ever need. He made every tree to grow that that was pleasant to the eye and that was good for food. 
He provided every herb, every beast, every bird for their sustenance. And he put it all in a garden and basically said to Adam and Eve, enjoy. My gift to you, enjoy. But do you know what was missing from that little utopian world? Eden had no hospital and it had no cemetery. And that's because the very nature of God is contrary to the concepts of death and burial. His nature is one of light and life. But all of that changed when Adam and Eve disobeyed. They now know an emotion that they had never experienced before. Fear. The first thing that they did after they disobeyed <coughs> was to go and hide. They'd never known that before. Every day the Bible says that God would come and he would commune with them. They would have that time with the Lord. But then after they had chosen to partake of that which had been forbidden, fear entered into their emotions and into their mind. And when God came, they hid themselves. Now not only do they know what fear is, but now they have to face judgment. As God banished them from this beautiful garden that he had prepared and given to them. So now they know separation. Now they no longer have that daily communion with God. And I have to believe that since the Bible teaches us about a God whose very essence is love, that it broke his heart to have to banish Adam and Eve. That was not his plan. That was not what he wanted for them. But he gave them restrictions. He gave them barriers and, 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 and they, they trespassed that. And so now they live under the curse. That of a woman bearing children. That of a man working by the sweat of his brow. Separation. But Hosea, years later, <clears throat> Hosea would reveal God's ultimate plan to utterly destroy death and the grave. And nearly 800 years after Hosea's prophecy, <clears throat> the Apostle Paul tapped into it and he clarified it a little bit. To the believers in Corinth, he would write, So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now notice the words here, along with the words in Hosea. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus 
turn Satan's plan on its head and what he had meant for evil, Jesus used for good. The terror of death was abated when the power of God's grace was manifested in Christ. And that's what the first advent did. The cries of, O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That cry was silenced by the chorus of that heavenly host that appeared to the shepherds that were out in the field that night and they said, I bring you great tidings of joy for this night in the city of David is born the Savior, Jesus Christ. And as great and as glorious as that is, we can only look back on it. Because the first advent reminds us that the long-awaited Messiah has indeed already come. It reminds us that we no longer have to look for him. But that now he seeks us. That now he stands at the door and he knocks. And he says, if any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in. We can only look back at that. And experience what that first advent allows us to have today in Christ. But the next advent, the one that we should now anticipate and be excited about, is going to deal with death once and for all. The evil one is going to be crushed and God's people are going to be ushered into what can only be described as a place of splendor. John gives us a glimpse in the 21st chapter of Revelation. In a beautiful word picture, he pulls back the curtain just a little bit and allows us to peer into the future. And John writes, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will be no more death, no sorrow, no crime. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away. Then he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. What a place heaven is going to be. Scriptures tell us that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Streets of gold. No more sickness. No more sorrow. Not, not even a tear. No more death. 
No more separation, for now that has been conquered. Not going to be any more goodbyes or see you laters up there. Down here we experience that. We know the pain and the trauma and the anxiety of that. But up there, never happened again. Rooms in the Father's house the size of mansions. Tree that bear a variety of fruit from the same tree all year round. One day it will be a peach tree. You go by next week, it will be apple. Hard to imagine that, isn't it? Wild animals down here going to be tame up there. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb. The child's going to be in the midst of them. It's all going to be peace. Rivers that are flowing with water that is of unimaginable clarity. Music. The most beautiful you've ever heard. And then what about that reunion? <laughs> A reunion with loved ones and friends that have gone before us. With those that we only read about. Those historical figures of scripture. But up there. We're all going to be known as dear friends. And Jesus. Jesus. Our kinsman redeemer, <coughs> glorified and majestic, seated on the throne of heaven. <clears throat> and a chorus of angels that I believe will be joined by every one of us that are there will cry, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty, who is worthy to receive glory and honor. A splendid place. A place that goes beyond our natural comprehension. This is just a glimpse. And it's going to be for eternity. Not, not just a, a week vacation to someplace majestic. Not, not just a short season. But forever. Eternal. And we can't begin to imagine it. The way that it's really going to be. But as surely as he came the first time. He's coming again. Amen. He is coming again. And he wants us to be ready. For that appearing. I, I don't know how long it will be. The promise of a Messiah was made years and years and years in advance of the time when everything was right and Jesus came. I'm sure that some gave up. I'm sure that there were those that said it, it's, it's not happened in my parents' and grandparents' lifetime, I doubt it's going to happen in mine. The Bible even says in the book of Hebrews that there were many that died having not received the promise. But Jesus is true and he is faithful. And what he promised, he, he didn't put a time on it. He just said, I will send the Messiah. And he did. 
And when Jesus left, he said, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So don't let your hearts be troubled. And this message has been preached time and time again and over and over again for centuries. Ministers have stood in pulpits and told of this promise of the Lord to return. And there are skeptics that would say it's not happened yet. It's just a fantasy. It's just something that you hope for, but it's not really based in any reality. And perhaps some has even believed it. And they've turned back. Maybe they no longer believe that he's going to come again. But the promises of God are not based on whether I believe them or not. The promises of God are based in the faithfulness of God to not be able to lie. And so he's going to come again. And our Advent, yes, let's celebrate. Let's decorate the sanctuary. Let's put up the tree. Let's do the, the narratives and let's do the plays and let's relive that precious old story. <laughs> But let's do that understanding that this has already taken place. I, I can't anticipate something that has already happened. I can look back at it. I can celebrate it. But I can't anticipate that Jesus is going to come as a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. That, that happened over 2,000 years ago. But what I can anticipate, what I can look forward to, what I can get excited about is that this season reminds me that he's coming again, that another advent awaits those that are looking for his appearing. And when he comes, he's going to bring splendor. That splendor awaits those that wholeheartedly receive Christ as their Savior and yield their lives to Him as Lord. I would not dare to try to assume what anyone in this house today or who may be listening to me or who may listen to this sermon sometime in the future, I would dare not try to assume what your relationship is with the Lord. But I would simply encourage you that if you have never confessed your sin to the Lord, if you have never acknowledged yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior until the Lord comes in glory he extends that invitation and I would encourage you today please don't let the opportunity pass you by acknowledge him ask him into your life and make him Lord today. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Father, thank you for your word today. Thank you for the invitation to come. I thank you today. As much as I want to experience heaven 
as much as I get excited about all this that I read about and hope for. There's still a part of me that thanks you that you tarry. Because every moment that you tarry gives someone an opportunity to know you. Someone who is separated by you and from you. Someone who is dead in their sin and in their trespasses today are offered eternal life because you came. Because you executed the plan of the Father. And at Calvary, you were able to say it is finished. Now, people can come to me. They can know what it's like to be reunited, the creator with the created. And I pray today that by the Holy Spirit, that you would draw people unto you and that they would surrender their hearts and their lives to you today. And for those of us that have already experienced that, let us leave this place today with a renewed vision and a new anticipation that we're one day closer to that second coming. And we want to be ready when you appear. Amen. Amen. I invite you to the table of the Lord today in communion to our guests that are here today. We observe what we call an open communion, an open table, which simply means you do not have to be a member of our church to uh, worship with us at this time. And uh, we have communion packets that were available as you came in, but uh, if you happen not to get one, uh, our elder will get one to you if you'll just raise your hand. We do not want anyone to uh, be absent from the table that wants to be present. This is something we do each week as we observe the Lord's dedication to us. It wasn't just that he would come, but that he would come to die. We relive that scenario at Easter. But each week we visit that here at First Christian Church. Jesus was very careful at the beginning of his earthly ministry. He didn't really want to draw attention unto himself. There were times when he would do a miracle and he would tell the person receiving it, don't, don't say anything to anybody about who did this. Of course, they would anyway, but he, he was just a humble man. <coughs> But upon giving the greatest sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, before the cross, knowing what he would face, he had a dinner with his disciples. This would be the last time that they would be together for the observance of Passover. So he has a meal with and after that meal, the Lord instituted a memorial unto himself. Because he wanted not only his disciples, but those that they would teach. And for us today in 2023, to not forget the love and the dedication and the care that Jesus has for us. He used what he had available. 
He used bread and wine. After supper was ended, they had all eaten until they were full. So it was probably a little perplexing as they watched perhaps what they thought was Jesus playing with his bread. But as he blessed it and he broke it, he gave it to them and he said, Take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. And likewise, he took the cup. After blessing it, he gave them, gave it to the disciples and said, Take and drink all of it. This is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many. Do this as often as you do it in remembrance of me. <coughs> Let's bow our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you today for your invitation to all who would want to come to your table. It is at the table that we take a moment to individually commune with you, to give you thanks, to just do a little inventory of our lives, to realize how blessed we are because of you. Lord, today it's here at the table that we honor you, that we vow that we will never forget the price that you paid for our salvation and eternal life. Father, today I pray that each one will be strengthened, that each one will be encouraged today. And Father, that we will leave the table with a renewed desire and energy to serve you. And to serve you by serving each other, by serving our community, by serving our fellow man, by taking the blessings that you have allowed to flow into our lives and to use that as a resource to be a blessing to others. That they might see you. That they might be intrigued to ask. And that we might share with them this beautiful story of Advent, of your coming, of your death, burial, and resurrection, and of your promise to come again. Father, I pray that in this Advent season that we look back upon, that we also look forward to that glorious day. Let us anticipate the splendor that awaits those that are in Christ Jesus. For it's in your wonderful name we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Larry's going to come and lead us in our closing hymn today. I invite you to stand as we all sing together. Turn to number 119. O thou joyful, O thou wonderful. 119. <clears throat> Oh, 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 oh,
bless you all. Thank you again for coming and joining with us today. I pray that your week is uh, just wonderfully blessed of the Lord. Uh, those that may be traveling this week, I know that there are some that will be, uh, but if you're traveling, may the Lord ride with you and protect you and bring you home safe and sound. So uh, as we were blessed today, let's leave this sanctuary determined to be a blessing throughout our week. As we are dismissed today, let's pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.